call on your female high self to be in front of you. Mm -hmm. Let's do the source to source thingy with the Let's just ask, um, so um, how many incarnations did you actually have in Atlantis? Ten. Ten. Mm -hmm. And uh, are there um, like uh, other incarnations like mermaids and uh, giants have ever included into this too? Or is this just a humanoid Atlantean? Yeah, humanoid Atlantean and Murphy. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. So which one? Okay. Yeah, which? Um, um, sorry. So as the yeah. um, as um, I evolved um, consciously, I evolved from the mer people up to the human. Okay. And um, so before you incarnated as mer people, did you incarnate also in whales and, and other um, intelligent mammals? Dolphins. Dolphins. Mm -hmm. And so are you still is still of your of your soul? Is she also still at the moment incarnated in dolphins? Yeah, this is where the playful energy comes from. <laughs> well, let's call on your so how many aspects of you are in dolphins at the moment? On dolphin bodies. Three. Three. Mm -hmm. Three. So, yeah, okay. Well, call them in. Yeah. There here they are, and then tingling all over, and send some source love to all three of them. And just merge with your energy. You know, they can merge with your humanoid energy, and you merge with their energies. I'm also getting that psychic part of the psychic energy that I have now it was developed as um, as my dolphin incarnation. Yeah. So dolphins, they have this huge brain. So ask it, ask them to show you how they see the world underwater. And you just describe what you see if it's different than the humanoid ways of seeing things. So theirs is mainly through. Um, through seeing it in their mind's eye and sense, just the in the knowing of. That is correct. Mm -hmm. okay. So, do they see water as water an object obstacle to them? They see the vibrations of the water. They can see the the energy through the water. They can see where the water flows. Uh, they can see the current, um, and they can see the energy of other other beings within the water um, and it all sort of filters through and becomes one larger picture. They can see it all as a web. We would, humans on the earth would actually be able to see this where they more open um, some, some experiences that some humans have whilst they are open, they can see this energy as well. Uh, but whilst they, um, the dolphins are underwater, they can see this at all times because they are open enough. Mm -hmm. Do they? Um, how do they perceive like magnetic fluence from the Earth radiation? I feel it. I feel it. Mm -hmm. Do they follow it like we follow rivers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This um, it shows them their journeys of where it is that they need to go, migration routes, um, safe birthing areas, um, and also the feeding grounds as well. There, it's all it's all connected. They're able to follow it all, almost like a map. Now, how about ley lines? You know, humans are concerned with ley lines, not so much with magnetic lines. So how do they perceive ley lines and how do they use those? Ley lines are similar. They're felt in a different way. They're felt through, um, they're felt through a different kind of energy. Um, it's more um, like a, a pulling towards rather than a, just a sensing of it being there as it is with magnetic with ley lines. It's uh, like an inner pulling towards those areas and um, by keeping on track with those areas it pulls, pulls them along. Mm -hmm. So are there particular ley lines that they enjoy and that they follow? So at the moment I can see a ley line going all the way up the 
west coast of Africa and up past Portugal, up that way. I don't know if there is actually a ley line there, but I've just seen that. I've just seen, yeah, the west, the west coast of Africa in my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, probably should be like a continental divide. Mm -hmm, yeah, I mean, this would be a major one. So mm -hmm. now, like humans, you know, they build churches and other important buildings, like capital buildings on crossing ley line, positive ley lines. So they get charged up. So do dolphins and other intelligent sea mammals or congregate on power spots like that? Yes, they do, yeah. Are there particular activities that they do at those spots? So it's almost like a, a large social meetup. But, um, I've just got the image of um, of Stonehenge in my mind when everybody gets there for, for, for solstice. Um, I've just got the image of that with um, the, the dolphins and the whales and the mer people. That um, it's almost like a, a social social part. They congregate together at these hot spots. Uh, they share share knowledge, share stories, and um, and share energy together. Excellent. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> um, so how do they chat? You know, how do they speak to each other? Uh, through telekinesis, uh, they they send. They're able to send each other images. Uh, they're able to send each other, um, sort of just communicate how me and you are communicating right now they're able to just communicate just by looking at and just sending those thoughts to one in it, one another they can also send energy to one another so well there we know that there is a shattering in the little twittering and of course whales they have a they're on the bar, base level you know they're seeing there but then there's also seems to be telepathy right so um is there a difference you know, or do they use them in conjunction with each other, like we use hand gestures with our language? Yeah, it's all part of, um, like, as you just said, body language. Um, it's all it's all used together to convey different messages um, and to convey different messages of energy. Um, the bass tones are more sort of serious things, whereas the higher pitched ones um, and the images are more lighter, lighter energy. Mm -hmm. So what are those guys chatting about? <laughs> you know, those dolphins. I mean, really, you know, this is like... <laughs> what's the gossip? <laughs> yeah, yeah, what's the gossip? What do they gossip? Is it like the earth energies there or the human experiences or fishnet experiences or sexual exploit? You know, I mean, uh, what are they talking about? So they, uh, they do talk a lot about the, the human impact on the oceans and um, the way that not only pollution but overfishing is causing issues within the oceans and the food, the food chain for the creatures that are living in the sea. Um, they attempt to help, help with this by putting their energy into areas that need extra healing, um, so areas especially... I've just got an image of um, is it the deep sea trawlers um, that sort of grate along the seabed, where a lot of that is um, is taken up. Energy is put there to help it to heal and to grow again, so that ecosystems can be reborn and uh, the food chain can be secured again. Uh, so they talk a lot about that, um, about the migration routes of where it is that's safe, um, where there's particular human activity. They know where to try and avoid. Whaling has now become um, more legalised, I think, in sort of Japan and Russia and areas like that. And that, that is talked about quite a lot as well. So that the messages of where to avoid um, is, is spread around so that not, not as many are killed because it causes a huge amount of pain. So um, do they know about the good activities of humans, that some humans um, yeah. like cut them loose and yeah. that they enjoy their performances? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they, um, they feel the energy. Um, not just humans, they're even sort of domestic animals. They're um, at ports and things like that. They um, Dogs especially, they play with, um, with dogs quite a lot. Um, they find dogs quite amusing, actually, I think, because they're... <laughs> Dogs are also very high energy, they're very positive, uh, they're very light, they're very playful as well, and um, they do enjoy seeing them as well. Um, they they like to build a relationship with um, with the humans, it's nice. 
they know that it's not all bad. Uh, we're not all bad. There, there are a lot out there that do love do love the earth. But, uh, there's a lot out there that bless um, that bless the sea, uh, that send their love into the sea, and they can see the work that is being done by conservationists to help rebuild um, ecosystems, um, coral reef systems, um, and see helping with animals that are that are trapped. Uh, they can see that. And the litter is being cleared up, although they, they say that it's going to take a long time. There's a lot of pollution, a lot of work yeah. needs to be done, um, and a more of a conscious effort needs to be done to, to help it and fix it long term. Because as quick as we're tidying it up, it's being thrown in somewhere else. Yeah, you apologise on behalf of the humans. You apologise on behalf of the humans to them. So um, you said that they are actually do healings on certain areas. So uh, let's see, how do they do this? Is this the projection of um, wonderful chi or what are they doing? Um, I, I feel a projection of energy. Um, so it's almost, um, I, I can see like the heart energy and I can see the vibrations going through the water um, of where it is that they're projecting this energy. Um, it's almost sort of they're bringing it in through source and then pushing it straight back out um, to concentrate it on the areas that need the most healing. Do they use our Stargate technology to get it from source or do they filter it more through chakras? I'd say Stargate. Stargate. Um, I, I can see it sort of coming in sort of all around them and sort of coming in from up and then it's sort of being pushed straight back out again. It's almost like a, a reconditioning um, of, the, of the ecosystem there. Like we would, re we could recondition soil and they can re recondition the seabed and coral reef system. So they're basically running source energy and uh, heaven energy onto onto those depleted areas, she depleted yeah. areas. Just redirecting the energy as it's all connected anyway. Sometimes it just needs to be focused, almost like when you focus, uh, when you have a magnifying glass, you can focus the sun's energy into a single point. They're doing the same sort of thing. They're pulling it in and focusing it where it needs to be. Good. Have you asked any volunteer and heavenly being, higher dimensionals, that also like to, you know, help and support, you know, our dolphin friends and whale friends to, to purify, you know, we invite them, you know, as humans, you know, to also help and clean those human beings. Um, 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 mm -hmm. So they have permission now. So it's not only the dolphins that have to do so. Good. Now, how could the uh, humans, um, do their visualization help, you know, those depleted places? They can visualise seeing it as full of life, um, as clear, clean, um, as a calm, happy place with with that is full of life, that, that has a thriving ecosystem. If they can envision how it should be, um, then it will come into into fruition quicker. Just Thank you. Focus on how it should be. So how do dolphins um, see humans from their perspective? Do they see them like optical, like we do, or do they see more of force field? They can see our energy too. They see it and they sense it as well. It's not, um, it's not all visual with the dolphins. They're all over their body. They can, they can feel the vibrational energy through the sea and, um, when they come into contact with humans as well, especially when humans are in the water. Although I've just, <laughs> they just said to me they don't like sun cream. <laughs> sun cream is full of uh, a lot of heavy metals and yeah. um, a lot of other chemicals that interferes with that. Um, it, it, it feels murky toward, towards them, it sort of clouds everything. Um, so they, they generally can pick it up, but certain chemicals does cloud it for them. Olive oil. <laughs> yeah. Use olive oil. It's yeah. better, better and cheaper. Okay. Yeah, coconut oil is good too. I like oh, coconut oil. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. So um, they're basically empaths as such? Yes, massively, yeah. And so do they understand our language? Uh, you mean when we talk to them or do they you know, pick up pick up telepathically or just read our emotions? Like we would read the emotions of a dog. So they read the emotions, uh, mostly they read the emotions, but because they've been around humans for a really long time, they have been quite good at learning um, learning certain gestures in communication. So, um, again, the body language, they're able to pick up on the body language. They can, they can sense um, in a way somebody is moving, um, whether their intentions are good or bad. 
um, we have especially when it comes to areas uh, where dolphins and whales are fished um, and killed there they know that yeah they're, they're able to sense those areas although it is quite difficult for them to always get the message across to everybody so that all of their fellow king can get out before mass killings occur it, it can be quite difficult do you need the whales for that to broadcast it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, because the whales are so loud um, and because the, their vibration is so deep, it travels a lot further. So part of the whale song is um, part of the reason why it's so deep is because it travels a lot further and it um, is a lot more efficient in sending messages. Yeah, so um, now they can perceive humans above this how do they do they have a connection to the planets or to the, the milky way galaxy as such they do yes they, they are of the of the galaxy of the universe mm -hmm. let's say do they uh, sometimes relate to the different planets like um, to mars um, to jupiter and saturn in certain ways that they connect to the energies or you know read the astrology as such they're able to sense the the movement of the stars and that that's a magnetic sense magnetic sense yeah they're, they're able to track as part of another way that they're able to, to move around actually is um the magnetic energy of where everything's turning and the, the constellations and the position yeah, Planet. They feel those energies, right? <laughs> yeah, they do. They're so open. Good. Just got yes. serious in my, in my mind as well. Serious, very serious. Mm -hmm. So let's ask the dolphins. So, you know, you are kind of awakened to these higher realities now. And you, you know, you, these are actually parts of your soul. So is there something that we can do with this connection, you know, for the benefit of the dolphins and for the benefit of the humanity? You know, is there something you guys can cooperate in certain ways? So let's ask, what do the dolphins have to offer to the humans? And then we can also ask what the humans, how the humans can offer, you know, what you can offer to your three dolphins that you have. Mm -hmm. So uh, they can offer the, the psychic aspect. Um, and also being more in tune with the energy. Um, if, if I'm able to integrate those more, um, that will help to open up my psychic abilities and also my, although I'm very empathetic already, um, it, it gets closed off. But I think where energies, especially as a human, energies are mixed so much now, um, part of me has unconsciously closed that off to stop myself from being overwhelmed. I need to learn how to channel it properly so that I know when to open it and when to close it without depleting my own energy source. Well, we asked your high self to please optimize this for you. So whenever it's necessary and advantageous to open the channels and whenever it would be a botheration is, you know, distracting you, that this be then closed. So there will be intelligent transmissions from now on. Amen. So uh, they will help you in your psychic abilities, um, basically on all fields, I guess, of healing. Yes, for me, um, inner knowing has always been a particular, a particularly str a strong sense for me. Um, it's the trust. <laughs> it's the trust that I lack. Um, again, living in a world where seeing is believing. Um, I think in the past that I have used this ability and um, it's come against me. I think in the past life I, I have been, I was killed as a witch um, for using the, for using those senses. So that has prevented me from moving forward with fully embracing those, although they are there. Um, part of me is still quite guarded. Um, so that can be opened up again. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we definitely want to do this and we, of course we give, you know, the, especially the dolphins from your own personal part, permission to assist with this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let us um, go now. Oh yeah, uh, let's see. The one, th um, the good communication is established. How do humans you know, do as an individual human can assist 
you know, your three dolphins there is whatever gift you have as you have as a human. Our, our gift towards them can be with grounding, um, and also with with sending pure intentions to the, to the ocean, not just seeing it as something that's for for us to exploit, um, for us to for us to see it as something that we also need to to embrace and to help conserve and to help heal. Um, a lot of energy is put into Mother Earth, but a lot of people tend to think about the Earth that they can actually see. Um, they don't necessarily think about the oceans because we can't see most of that. Um, so people need to think about putting their healing into the oceans just as much as they do into the the above ground earth. Mm -hmm. So you were describing before when the dolphins were doing healing on the earth mother in certain areas that they were actually you know, running source love as well as heaven love into them and not earth love. <laughs> so um, I thought this, but they like to have grounding from the humans. So um, so they have a problem with uh, grounding. Is this um, an issue for them? Yeah, I think because they're so psychic, that's such a, it's a higher realm almost. Um, and that, that's generally where they spend a lot of their energy. I think they can, they could benefit from coming back down to not the lower energies, the more the more of the earthly energies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, why don't you, you know, do you have your three dolphins there and why don't you smile, don't scare them now and uh, pull on some earth love as much as you can and send it to them. Mm -hmm. Just keep pumping earth love onto them and then let them tell you, so how does grounding, when you ground them, affect them? means that they're better able to, to focus in the here and now um, with the with the telepathic energy they they can also get quite um, sort of carried away in what's what's going on in their minds rather than what's going on right in front of them um, so it, it would just help them to focus their their healing energy towards um, healing healing the oceans a bit more. Yeah, okay, so basically crown chakra, when you're only a crown chakra, you become a space cadet. <laughs> and that is exactly yeah. yes. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, we want to heal you. <laughs> right? And you are like pulling them back to this reality. Yeah. But <laughs> I've just seen actually, um, because dolphins, they also use, is it is it the puffer fish that they use to make themselves okay. high? I've just yeah, they, um, I've just seen them doing that actually, and sort of almost like giggling <laughs> together, like they're getting high. <laughs> it's almost like their form of distraction. Um, I think where a lot of them have experienced quite a heavy amount of generational trauma through um, through sort of overfishing and quite barbaric hunting, this, um, and sort of seeing the destruction that's happened to their home. Um, a lot of them are actually quite traumatized. Um, and things like things like that to help to distract them. They they want to be able to heal, but also they're they're trying to, to heal themselves as well. Yeah, just like Native Americans, you know, their whole life, their culture got destroyed, everything taken away. That's so nice. very similar way, you know. Who can yeah. blame? Who can blame? You know, with so much pain. You know? Yeah. You just don't want so to the be grounding pain. energy that they they will get from the earth will help them to. To, to heal and to overcome the pain that they've experienced and to continue. Um, but it's almost like they have their own things that they're, they're put on this earth to do, and that is to help it, help to heal their environment. Well, we asked, you know, right now for volunteer beings, you know, from the earth realm. This may be gnomes or fairy beings, you know, other beings that can help, you know, the dolphins to ground, you know, we asked that, um, you know, Kindly, kindly, you know, to assist the dolphins. We give them permission as humans. We apologize that at this moment the human mastermind is not able to do so. I hope maybe, you know, when we can publish this, this will help at least set this in motion. But we give you nature spirit, you know, and as long as it is okay with Mother Gaia, <laughs> because she has to approve. 
But if, and if it's for the highest good, you know, so we please ask you to support the dolphins and the whales in getting grounded and, you know, releasing their negative emotions, you know, the, the trauma that has been with them, you know, the generational trauma, you know, from whaling and, I mean, just deep disrespect, you know, deep disrespect that has been given to those beautiful creatures. It's like, you know, nailing the Jesus onto the cross, you know, again and again and again, you know, creatures of unconditional love, you know, of, of a lot of love. Let's put it like that. Yeah, thank you. Now, we heard, of course, a lot with uh, pregnant women swimming with dolphins and that their kids turn out as geniuses. <laughs> okay. Or at least highly enhanced. Mm -hmm. okay. Ask whether this is true. So again, as part of the, the energy that they're able to pick up on when somebody's in the water, water is like a conductor as it conducts electricity, it also conducts energy. Um, and where the, the fetus is in the uterus, that is also surrounded by water, so it, it, it can penetrate straight in. Um, so dolphins are able to to send their energy in into the growing fetus um, and help support it growing. Um, yeah, I've got, I've got like an image of like a, lar a larger brain almost. Uh, dolphins' mm. brains are so much larger than humans, they're able to um, help the, the human baby to, to also enlarge in their brains. And uh, when they're growing and, yeah, when they're growing, their, their brain size is able to increase. Yeah, somebody told me, you know, his wife swam with a dolphin and his child started talking full sentences and is one year old. <laughs> I mean, I, so yeah. Um, the energy going directly from the dolphin to the to the fetus. This, yeah, that I can see the ripples just going straight into from water to water. Mm -hmm. Let's say, um, could they also assist you? Let's say if you do a hands-on healing or like a healing on somebody else, like you know, or like on Skype, like we're doing right now, can they also help? You know, from the astral plane. They could, yeah. Yeah, they can. Okay, the energy within the water is the same as the energy above, above the water. Okay. And you can just pay them back by running grounding energy into them, and they do what they do best, and you get grounded. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, so let's go to a lifetime where you were a mermaid. And uh, let's say the most important and influential on, in this aspect of your life, you know, let's connect with this one first. Mm -hmm. And are you a male or a female at this lifetime? You're female. Mm -hmm. And do you live in a community of mer people? We do, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, just to check this place out, so how does this look like? It's like a huge underground city. Is it in a cave or is it just in the open ocean or in a bay? At the bottom of a continent. Can you repeat? So, so it's at the bottom of a continent where the rock goes, um, obviously goes down for miles. Um, that, that is used as sort of a, a backdrop to build up the, the civilization from there. It also mm -hmm. means they're connected then to the earth directly by having, yeah, by having those buildings there. Mm -hmm. So do they uh, kind of stack things up? Like uh, we do bricklaying work, do they um, stack rocks up or how do they create their dwellings? You see, is it stalactites? Is that the correct word for it? Where is the really tall mineral formation? I can see a lot of those. Um, and sort of the almost like caves going into the bedrock um, for these rocks that are part of the continent. Yeah, I can see. So are they, are they basically using already existing caves or do they also manipulate like a moving rock or adding rock somewhere? They're able to move and manipulate, but they're, they're, the, main, um, the main sort of structure of it is manipulating what is already there. There's a lot of tunnels um, and a lot of passageways and um, sort of, yeah, like little cave parts in there as well that they're able to take advantage of. It's almost like having that sort of foundation there that they're then able to add extra bits onto as they, yeah, as they see fit and as they grow. Uh -huh. And so this is, of course, in the past, right? Um, I assume. 
Um, let's just ask, so are these uh, beings still existing at this time? A few of them are made. You know, we don't want to you know, reveal anything about them, so they need <laughs> to survive. They're not too happy with the humans, I guess. <clears throat> And so, in, um, do you guys have any technology uh, as such, of what we consider technology, or are you all telepathic and just very living a very simple physical life as such? Very telepathic. I'm guessing that there used to be technology, um, but I've I've just seen an image of the um, of like bomb testing within the water and where the frequencies of that and the vibrations of that it just it destroyed a lot of. Not only their home, but also their technology as well, because it was vibrational, it was sensitive to vibrations, and that we're bomb testing, especially the atomic bomb. Is that how I say it? Atomic bomb. Oh, this must have. Oh, yeah, the atomic bombs. I mean, underwater. I mean, air compresses. You know, water does not compress. Exactly. So this shockwave must have travelled. I mean, huge amounts. It nearly it's, it's probably wiped really out continents, right? Yeah, it's not only the, the vibrational fallout that it's caused, but also the chemical fallout. It's um, the, the mer people were very sensitive to the chemicals um, and the chemicals that are in the ocean that have come from bomb testing and also the pollution has, has made them very sick. And then yeah. they to survive. a lot of the foods uh, that they consume is also poisonous um, where it used to be. It used to be fine and it used to nourish them. Now, actually, it kills them slowly. I yeah, apologize on behalf of the humans. Was this actually done on purpose? Uh, were the humans you know, let to do this, to destroy those uh, you know, those mer people on purpose by other dimensional beings? I think where a lot of the a lot of the negativity the humans um are under the influence of, obviously there are other sort of dark beings out there, negative beings out there. Um, it is part of a, a conscious effort to destroy higher vibrational beings um, yeah. because the, the higher the vibrations you are, the more, the more you're able to evolve and the more you are able to connect to source and to live a free life. Um, yeah. The lower vibrational beings do not want that because you can't, you can't. Um, we appeal to source to please rectify this, this genocide. And this wonderful high vibrational being, you know, we need to help. So please clear as much by just by your mercy. Just clear as much of the trauma, of the pollution, of the radioactivity, of the chemical pollution, of the emotional pollution, you know, the devastation of their life. Please, you know, traverse as much as possible. Um, um, to really apologize on behalf of the humans. Yeah. We ask the angels to just pour a lot of love, unconditional love on those people, so they get nourished in their pain, you know, get transmuted. And, and, and wherever they get stuck, you know, especially from those atomic explosions, there must be lots of them just stuck on the astral plane, in you know, horrible death. So we like to have them escorted to the Arcturian of Healing and Ascension Temples, and shown their higher perspective on their life. Help us forgiveness, bathed in unconditional love by source, and then escorted into the heavens, into the higher vibrations. We joined with her people or their soul or whatever is the best one. And, um, 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 I'm so sorry. Okay. So let's go back, you know, to this city there. So you're basically rather biological, you know, rather than touch with mission. So what is your job in there? Let's say the most important job that you have there in that incarnation. What do you do there? Okay, I help to help to lead the community um, bring people together. Um, almost like a, like a mayor of the community or mayoress <laughs> of the community. Um, yeah, help to make sure that everybody is okay, everybody is home, has a suitable home, has suitable food, and sort of overseeing the, the general wellness of the community. So what do the people do for food? 
seaweed. Uh, they eat a lot of uh, plant life um, within the sea. Um, that they they do eat some small um, sort of crustaceans, but they're, they're, they're mainly they mainly just eat um, plant life. Mm-hmm. And so, um, <clears throat> of course, there are a certain amount of the population. There's construction and the normal things that are also in the human world. Um, but beyond this, um, how um, do mer people interact with the oceans? Like we already seen dolphins cleaning up certain parts and of the ocean, uh, with, like a Reiki healing. So, um, what are the mer people doing? So they're also able to do that. Um, again, they help they help sea creatures, um, help any that are sort of in trouble, especially nowadays with um, with pollution. Um, ones that are sort of stuck in nets and have things stuck in them as well. They're able to help guide, um, and also they're they're part of the communications uh, within the the whaling within the whales and the dolphins. They they share those communications as well. They share stories. Um, and knowledge of, of what is going on and where it's going on. Um, they're able to sort of they're able to perceive humans a little bit easier. Um, I think because they're slightly more humanoid um, in their in their characters and in their shape, they are able to um, sort of act more as like a, a middleman. Although the dolphins are very good at perceiving um, human emotions and human thoughts. Um, the mer people are also very good at that as well, and they're able to sort of act a good reason between the two at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've come across this before. They're the middlemen between humans and the ocean people. We'll get to this a little later. Mm-hmm. So, um, <clears throat> so there seem to be the mer people seem to be like the gardeners of the ocean. Is this like we garden an ocean or fields, they uh, go and you know balance things. Even let's say the Native Americans, they did control burns to create yeah. meadows for the deer, etc. So they're doing similar things, just applied to the oceans and stuff. Yeah. And uh, they can shed with uh, the dolphins and whales. Is it in a way like we are shedding, or is it uh, more? Uh, it's more. <laughs> In the, uh, in the water, it's easier um, rather than sort of talking it, talking with their mouths like you and I are talking. It's easier to send mm-hmm. energy. With them. Mm-hmm. But they're basically yeah going beyond small talk as such. They can communicate in a very sophisticated way as such. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Ah. So um, let's see. Uh, so the. Dolphins were healing also with their chi projection and visualization. Now, do the mer people do something that's very similar, or do they have uh, very different options? They don't. They don't heal in the way that the dolphins do by pulling in uh, the star energy. Uh, they're more sort of physical healers um, in that they are able to sort of tend to tend to things. Um, obviously, they they limbs and things like that so they're able to physically manipulate things and physically help things and that is where that how they how they more do things mm-hmm. okay now um also um so are you guys at this time aware of humanoids and living on the surface yeah uh-huh and so what is your interaction with those at that time there's not a huge amount of interaction anymore um it's generally deemed unsafe to do so. Um, I I can see that they used to the, the communities underneath the bedrock, the, the rivers, they used to be able to travel up the rivers um, and communicate. Um, but yeah, that and even trade. And yeah, and trade. Um, but that, that doesn't tend to happen anymore. It's not something that is considered a safe thing to do. So the culture above Ground, the human culture, would this what we consider be Atlantean culture? Uh, not now, yeah, yeah. Used, to, used to be years yeah, and years in, ago. Yeah, in those yeah. times, yeah. yeah. So at that time, you know, when, when this incarnation was there, this was Atlantean culture. So what happened that made it unsafe? Was there rape? Uh, was there murder? Were there trapped for magic? Or uh, what was the deal? Um, so there was a lot of... Um, a lot of the mer people were, were stolen if they were 
to be seen above ground. Um, humans seem to think that they have magical properties, um, that their their skin and things like that can be used as for medicinal properties and magical properties and to help them cast spells. And um, obviously, this is before medicine and things like this used to were developed. And they would look to the natural world. Um, and much like in Chinese medicine, they look towards their animal world um, to help. They so they think to help their ailments. And um, people, there was a high price on mad people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just like with unicorns, and I mean, <laughs> even in voodoo, you, know, you got yourself a voodoo head. Yeah, even even if they weren't taken for medicinal properties, they would be taken. Um, just to just to show off that like you would have uh, something in a circus and uh, things like that were were quite common as well. So pay me, sure. come and see. Yeah, yeah, pay me and come and see the mermaid that I've got, that sort of thing. Yeah. So again, we apologize, you know, for the transgression of humans to the mer people. So well, how about your lifespan? Um, same lifespan as humans or longer lifespans? Very well. They were able to live longer, not so much now because they're, they're, they get sick. Um, a lot of them are born quite sick as well, where the the environment that they're growing up in is um, is yeah poison. That they don't live for as long, but they used to live for quite a long time. Now, did they have also um, encounters with what we call the dark side, like draconians and, and you know negative beings like the greys and uh, others? Unfortunately, the greys and the reptilians are infiltrated most areas of the world. Um, although they weren't sort of they weren't incarnated as um, as greys and sort of weren't necessarily controlled, they were able to feel the influence of others that were controlled by the greys and the reptilians. Mm-hmm. So they could stay away from them. They're very yeah. shy. They don't they don't like to sort of yeah put themselves out too much. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so is there um, any way that you can help, you know, the male woman from your side as a human? And healing. Mm-hmm. And healing. From source? This is too, okay, so let's ask, how did she die? Sickness. Can you repeat? Sickness. So just yeah, by being ill, the the food that we eat and the water that that we're breathing all the time, all the yeah, there's, there's so much sickness. Contamination. Mm. Yeah. And um, it, does it weakens, this? Weakens our, yeah, it weakens our bodies until eventually we we yeah. get too weak with anything. Frail health. Yeah. Does her death, dying like this, um, does this cannot trap her on the astral, so she cannot, um, you know, go to the heavens? She cannot trap on the astral plane. Yeah, the, the weakness, it's almost like the light, the light just faded, um, and wasn't able to cross over properly because it was too faded. Yeah, yeah. And how does this affect you in this lifetime as a human, as everything is having a bleed over? There's the feeling of um, the feeling stuck quite often, um, of not wearing, of not knowing how to progress and how to step forward, um, of the, the doubting of stepping forward. Um, yeah, but yeah, the feeling of being stuck. I see myself being stuck in the mud at the minute. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so she was like in a bad spot, so to say. How about if you, does she also affect your physical health to a certain degree? Low energy at times, um, where things um, I take on quite a lot, I end up feeling quite bogged down and then getting low energy from that. Mm-hmm. I think where um, in this life I took on a lot and a lot of energy, it bogged me down and then the, the physicalities of living in a contaminated environment um, accelerated that, um, that feeling of being bogged down and um, having low energy to the point where it eventually sucked me out. Now, um, let's ask whether most humans incarnate, did they also have incarnations as the mer people? 
not very many. It depends uh, what element you came from. I'm very yeah. firmly element. <laughs> Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Yeah, let's just get some statistics. Um, so let's say um, out of a hundred normal humans, you know, just cross section of human society all around the globe, or uh, let's say of a thousand, how many would have had past lifetimes as a normal person? Probably about ten, ten percent. Ten, ten percent, maybe twenty percent. Yeah. 10, but yeah, 10, 10. yeah. So and uh, so these so life experiences do they actually affect in work through the humans or it has just been kind of blocked in some way? It depends the manner of which um, of which they they passed on. Uh, for some of them they can be blocked, and uh, for some of them it um, it just kind of works itself away. So in general, it's a source of trauma for most humans because it didn't end that well. So, <laughs> people. so we asked for the heavenly volunteer ascension teams you know, to collect all the stark mer people and other, you know, intelligent beings of the ocean life that are stuck mm -hmm. due to you know toxicity, pollution. And um, black magic, you know, atomic explosions or any other stresses, like uh, you know the constant uh, noise from the trade ships, etc. Mm -hmm. So all these aspects we like to have, you know, uh, get sent help, brought to Arcturian Ascension temples or others, you know, where they will be serviced by the servants of Source and helped to forgive to ask for forgiveness, to get forgiveness, to see the higher perspective on their life experience. And then they'll be reunited with the heavens, with their loved ones, with their soul. Um, um, and all the trauma cleared as much as possible. Um, um, um. Okay, and yeah, and now just tap into your, well, take a mix of earth and Source love and send it to your mermaid aspects, to the mer people. And we asked the angelics to also send lots of love and light to those people. Um, um, And we ask the, that uh, there be way stations established in the oceans to help any other stuck beings, you know, that are still stuck on the astral, you know, to get home, to find home. Um, so let us now um, move on to your lives in Atlantis. And mm, let's just, it's 10, um, let's just, and you're very clear, let's just go and start at the furthest away in time, you know, so the earliest incarnation Atlantis you have. Mm -hmm. So what type of body did you have there? It's almost like a basic um, human body. I feel a bit bigger and a bit clunkier, not quite as well defined as a human body is now. Or the Neanderthal? Not quite Neanderthal, I just, um, I see like the hands are a lot bigger um, and the feet are quite a lot bigger. They're, um, they're not quite as, as slim as what they are now. The, yeah, the digits are, are a, lot bit, a lot bigger. Are you in a male or female body? I'm in a male body. What do you do as this male? What is your occupation? Builder. Help to build. You do, you're a builder? Yeah. Hmm? So, like a bricklayer or more like an architect? Uh, a bit more like an architect, so helping to design and build building. I'll, do, I'll build the building as well, but I'll also um, help to design the building. 
Aha. Now, are this kind of residential dwellings or is this more like uh, important structures, like bigger yeah. buildings? Yeah, it's part of the, the structure of the thing. Uh, important structures. Mm -hmm. So is this man available, uh, you know, aware of, you know, the higher, uh, about energies, for instance, uh, your earth energies, is he aware of earth energies? He, he is, um, but he really enjoys building. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that's where his passion lies. Uh, that's where he likes to put a lot of his energy is in creating and building. And he's quite fascinated with, with, with his hands. I think that this is where I'm getting the big hands from. Um, he's able to yeah, build a lot with, with his hands. So, um, okay, so how does he, you know, get the designs? Is this traditional stuff he's seen somewhere else? Does he have visions or does he just, you know, carefully construct this the logical thinking? He um, he just thinks about it. Um, he's very good at being able to see something and um, just visualizing how it could be and very logical thinking um, and good at deciding how, how something is going to be most efficient um, is able to yeah, to sort of draw on that and able to sketch it and then to, to build it. Mm -hmm. All right. So, <clears throat> uh, when he builds those things, does he also consider cheap performance or acoustic or certain resonance? It's like, you know, we have in pyramids or other uh, devices. Are those actually mm -hmm. cheap devices as such? Um, no, he's just looking for most efficient, uh, efficient building, uh, strongest and um, the, the best design for, for its purpose. So what's the biggest, best thing he did in his lifetime that he built? I can see lots of walls. Um, yeah, lots of the, the city walls um, or from the outside and also from the inside as well. I can see. Yeah, lots of really high tall walls. <laughs> uh -huh. So there was a danger from outside? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Now what were the enemies, the so-called enemies that you had to guard against? Um, so there, there's a lot of human presence um, and also I can see I can see giants as well. Actually. Can you repeat this? I can see giants as well. Giants? Giants. Okay, to use a different word. I'm not sure what you mean. Giant. Oh, dragons. No, not dra uh, oh, oh, giants. Oh, giants. Giants. <laughs> there are giants roaming around. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Oh, these are the, from the Nephilim. The, the kids of the Nephilim that eat humans, that like to eat humans. Um, I, I'm not actually sure, to be honest. So I can just, just ask them. Really, really, yeah. Uh, yeah, ask yeah. Them. Just, just ask them. Mm -hmm. Um, no, no, they're um, yeah, not people eaters. Um, they they work they work for humans. Um, they oh. well they work with humans, um, and yeah, they're trying to help the human race uh, to advance. Um, and they're they're aware that the Atlanteans are um, a lot more advanced than the humans. Uh, that they're naturally much more intelligent, much more psychic. Um, and because the giants are more of a human, of a human mind, they feel threatened by it. Um, so that the Atlanteans had to work hard to sort of keep things, yeah, within within their area, um, and from not being under attack. Mm -hmm. okay. where people wanted to steal their technology and um, to try and advance uh, their own civilization. Mm -hmm. Now, how do they defend, you know, if there's an altercation with the giants, what do they do? It's a swarming like, like ants and uh, you see human wave, or do they have particular weapons that they can use against the giants? So the Atlantean, um, obviously, defense is, um, is quite a big one, obviously, with the walls and things like that. Um, I can also see, um, like, a vibrational sort of laser. It's almost like a, a sonic kind of laser. Um, that they're able to um, to repel people with um, people and giants um, can't physically get any closer to to them. It's almost like a like a force field, let's say. Cool. So, um, 
how does the uh, male uh, die of a natural death? He's old. <laughs> yeah, old. Really yeah. old, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He made it into the heavens. He did. <laughs> he was yeah. all right. Uh -huh. He lived a simple life. He was all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, does he affect you in any way, you know, or can be helpful to you in any way? Uh, so an aspect that I have from him is the is simple logical thinking of um, how most efficient to do things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, especially when it comes to yeah, like strategic planning, like the logical way of viewing things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tesla, he could visualize everything in his head, and then you know troubleshoot it in his head. And then when he built it, it was just perfect. He didn't have to do much interpolation and, you know, correction as such. So this was number one. Let's just go to the second one after this one. Poke all that one in. And uh, are you in a male or a female body? I'm in a male body again. Mm -hmm. And what's your occupation there? Got drama. Drama? Farmer. It's use a different word. Uh, farming. Oh, farmer. Um, so farmer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, it's a, nice, it's a simple life again. <laughs> simple life. Um, well, let's just see. Um, are there? Uh, does he go by hand? Uh, how does he get his seeds? What does he use for fertilizer? Does he use magic or cheat? You know, I mean, what is the difference to your modern farmer as such? Uh, so in this aspect, he is able to farm things. Um, again, much more in tune with the energy of everything and the energy of plants and realizing that plants that you really enjoy um, they enjoy energy from people um, and that you can give positive energy towards the plant and it will help it to grow better. Uh, the same goes for the water that you give the plant as well. If you give the plant positive water, um, happy water, you could call it, it helps the plant to grow. So this is something that, uh, because water has memory, doesn't it? It has their molecular, molecular structure. Um, if you give water your positive energy and um, then it becomes um it sort of infuses it can infuse with you uh, the positive energy as well and the same goes for towards plants and um, if you direct energy uh, the plants will receive that and this farmer was yeah it was all about that okay yeah, ask him how does he make happy water i mean i know the rudolf steiner method where they make a fertilizer you know they spin something for for about an hour and uh, it's a you know a normal good fertilizer as such a natural with cow and you know cow poo and then let it sit for a year, but they make a homeopathic remedy of it so to say you know and then um, you don't need pesticides nothing what I see, and um, so let's see how does he make his happy water. And so he uses a lot of nutrients from fish water um, to keep fish and to, obviously to eat. Uh, the water from the fish is very high in nutrients, um, but you can also bless the water. Um, so you can you can sing to the water um, or you can even just concentrate your thoughts, especially if you have your hands in the water as well. You're able to send your energy into the water. Um, and this is uh, this is something that was practiced um, because they knew that if the plants were growing with this good energy, that then when you ate the plant, that you were also receiving that good energy. Yeah, it comes back in return. Now, um, in his opinion, uh, what type of chi you know makes the plants grow best? Is it earth chi? Is it heaven chi? Is it a mixture of chi? Is it source chi or a mixture of, um, of earth and heaven? Because the Atlantic people there are on Earth, but they're still very much connected to heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. And mm, let's say when he seeds, um, you know, those his uh, plants, um, does he pray? Uh, does he commune with other beings, let's say with the fairy king? Oh, yeah. What is his relationship with the fairy or fairy kingdom or other nature beings? Not getting anything from um, fairy. 
um, and more see a, a sort of a, a ritual of when they're planting and they plant in accordance to uh, the moon cycles um, and it's, it's sort of a big um, like community effort when they're when they're planting there and um, yeah they bless they bless the earth that they're putting the seeds into and um, obviously they're blessing the water they're watering uh, the seeds with as well it's become it's a very big ritual thing because they know that when they're planting this is the the next step of food uh, that they're receiving so a lot of energy goes into that mm -hmm. yeah so the um, let's say the they used to do the Beltane rites I think the Celtics, you know, they had sex in the fields. Do they do something similar? Yeah, they they party, they, they have sex, they dance, they listen to music. Um, all of those things create uh, good vibrations and are able to go um, into the earth, especially where people are barefoot as well, um, and even laying on the earth as well. All of that energy is able to seep straight into the earth. Yeah, anybody, yeah, anybody hearing this? So you know, you know how to get it. Better crop. All right. Did he die a natural death? He did as well. Yeah. 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 Okay. So he's in the heavens then. Yeah. He's in a nice and how, life. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And what kind of how does he affect you in this lifetime with switch gifts? I love the plants. <laughs> yeah. I'm a little bit obsessed with plants. Um, and also the the understanding of um, of how important water is and energy. Um, when you're growing things, the energy that you're putting into it, the, yeah, the understanding of how important that is. Yep, souped up water, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to incarnation number three in Atlantis. A male or female? A female this time. Ah, <laughs> and what's her job? Um, like a midwife, but I help to help the birth. Help women mm -hmm. to give birth. Mm -hmm. She's a midwife. Excellent. Well, um, so this is a very important point. Um, I, I, I know from my work that the birth trauma can be very, very severe. According to authorities on there's Leonard Orr with rebirthing, he considers this one of the worst traumas you have in your whole life. You know, Leonard, Dr. Uh, Standard Lars Off, pretty much the same opinion. Czechoslovakian psychologist. Um, so uh, let's see, uh, what are the special things that this midwife does that probably a modern Western mid midwife does not do? So this, um, all women used to do this again. It was um, it was a community thing when um, when somebody when a woman was giving birth, um, a lot of the other women would gather around her and support her as much as possible. Uh, not just during the event, but in the lead up to the event and after the event as well. Um, there was a lot of herbal medicine that was used to help support the, the mother before she were, before she had the baby, to help her labour to progress properly, to help her body to be strong, um, to reduce the amount of bleeding that she would have. Um, and to also, after, after the baby had been born, again, herbal medicine to help help her to stay strong, help her to produce breast milk and um, good healthy rich breast milk um, and generally just educating um, educating others into yeah how to have a, have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy birth as well. <laughs> having, a, having a birth was like a, was like a celebration is um, something that, that they were very excited and it was a yeah it was a big thing. So there was a lot of good energy there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and uh, nutritional supports on all levels so um, let's say uh, when the baby would you know appear uh, would they shear the baby up and send a lot of love yes there, um, there would also be like a like a birthing ritual um, so I was, it just came into my mind a minute ago that the energy that the baby is born into is the energy that um, will help to govern the baby um, as, as they progress in, throughout their life if the baby is born into a into a positive environment, that's what they're more going to be predisposed to a positive attitude. Uh, whereas they're born in if they're born into a negative environment, they can more they can find it a bit easier to to sink into a, a negative um, energy. They can find it harder to lift themselves naturally. 
Yeah. So this is why it was very important uh, when a baby was born to make sure that the atmosphere was um, was as positive as possible. Yes. Um, as an example, uh, I was stuck in my birth. I was ten and a half pounds. This means <laughs> oh, <mom. laughs> five point two five kilos. I mean, not oh, not American pounds, European pounds. My mom was narrow hipped. I got stuck for eight hours. She was in and out of consciousness, and also they gave her drugs. And yeah. so I had a super traumatic childbirth. And then um, they say when you had a traumatic childbirth, then you um, you know have um, depression um, yeah. when you're a teenager. You know this pain comes up. So um, I just give this as an example how important a positive birth is. Mm -hmm. I don't know how my son came out just like this. The, the doctor had his gloves on, and there he was. <laughs> 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 the door opened, and 15, 15 uh, nurses stepped in, and like this. There were angels around. I had walked angels. It was awesome. I told them they're going to slap you on the butt, cut you. Just, uh, that's how they do things. They're barbarians. We love you. you know? So, and carried him through. So, you know? so this mm -hmm. is really important for anybody, for any women that hear this, the way somebody is welcomed in this. After this trauma, so you are in paradise, kind of in the womb, and then you get pressed hard suddenly through the contractions, and it's life-threatening. You don't know what is going on. And then oftentimes, then after birth, you get immediately separated instead of like let it linger. Mm -hmm. And then you get carried away and wait and you know call stuff no mm -hmm. love right and then you get sub then you get reunited and hopefully can nurse with your mama you know and that is a moment where you know the only the love should flow and the binding should be you know but so here you were welcoming the child you know with a lot of love instead of carrying it away Yes, absolutely. You know, so very, very important. Very, 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 very important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say, uh, of course, not every birth, you know, goes as planned. And um, so uh, there were probably also um, you know, stillborn or kids are dying. So what did yeah. you do as a midwife when, when you noticed that, you know, there was a death involved? We would still allow the baby to be um united with the mother and um, it's very important for the mum to um to be with be with their baby whether they're here or in spirit um we were big believers of um allowing the mother to, to grieve in her own way um and to have her time with her child um because if the baby is born um and it is not living obviously the baby will be taken taken away at some point so we believe that the, the mother and the baby should still be able to have chance to connect although the baby may not have been there <clears throat> physically it was that the its spirit was still there spiritually um and the, the spirit of the baby was still born um so we believe that they should still be able to form a bond together and so we yeah we allowed them to have their their time together and then when the mother was ready to um put the baby to rest then we, we would do that we would have our own ceremony um, and extra support, obviously, for the mother. Um, yeah, lots mm -hmm. of that love given to the mother as much as possible, and the father too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice. Good. Now, um, would you also do things to guide that uh, soul home to the heavens again, or? Yeah, that's part of the um, the putting to rest ritual. Um, is allowing that soul to cross over um, into heaven and yeah, live their, live their life, well, their, their soul life, um, to be free from the earth plane so that they could incarnate fully into the next life. Mm -hmm. um, did the, uh, um, the midwife, did she die a natural death? Yes. Made it into the heavens? Mm -hmm. how, yes. does she, uh, how does she affect you in this lifetime with which gifts? Caring mother. Can you repeat? Um, so the caring mother. Um, so uh, yeah, just just very nurturing. Um, and yeah, just nurturing towards um, towards children, towards uh, mm -hmm. young 
people with animals that scare that character. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, now something else with midwives, this has come up in my work. I know midwives that would, you know, protect the babies that, of course, were in many cases not with their mothers from ghosts <laughs> that were in the hospital, you know, uh, trying to attach to those babies, trying to get into their bodies and take over their bodies. Uh, was there, first of all, the danger of something like this happened in Atlantis? And what would you do against, you know, to prevent something like this? Sorry, can you repeat that? Was the, was the what would happen? So, I've when I worked with midwives from past lifetimes, there were certain midwives that could see ghosts and protect the babies in the hospital from ghosts attaching to them. And like in the hospital, many people die; there are ghosts galore, and many they 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 knew that try to get into the body and live through their body, and. And so the the nurse would you know chase them away. <laughs> okay. um, so was this necessary in those times? And how did you do? How did you protect babies from evil beings or spirit? Part of the birthing ritual is to hold space uh, for the birthing mother and for the baby. Um, so there would be a cleansing ritual of the area that they were giving birth in, um, and all the people any of the people involved would also be cleansed as well um, and much like when you and I have a session um, and you sort of you say that there's a white light that's protecting us only the highest good can come through uh, they, they would do a very similar thing to ensure that the um, that the baby was born into a pure environment and that the mother and the baby were able to bond together fully without any sort of interference um, physically or spiritually cool Right. Well, let's go to lifetime number four in Atlantis, and where you're male or female in this lifetime? Female again. Mm -hmm. And what was your occupation? Teacher. And uh, what type of subjects or topics would you teach? So in um, in Atlantis, it wasn't sort of a, a rigid school system much like it is today. It was more just general life teaching, um, children would, um, would learn sort of whatever they needed to learn, uh, whatever they were interested to learn, they would learn some of the basics that they would need to see them through to being a successful adult, um, sort of degree and, um, and plant management, um, basic building skills um, and sort of sewing, things like that. But, but the teachers, it was almost, yeah, almost like a life teacher. Uh, not only were they taught uh, practical skills, but also emotional skills as well. Um, there were teachings into how to raise children, um, how to connect with themselves fully, um, how to practice uh, psychic abilities. Um, so all teachers were very sort of broad in what they were able to teach. It was more like a Woodhouse Steiner school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the same. That's the same. So, um, was there, I mean, you know, there is this Prussian school system where you repeat, and there are, of course, all kinds of different types of curriculum or curricula nowadays. <laughs> um, uh, so, how was yours different? I mean, it's tailor made like a mentor. But what was the major way of of learning things? Was this by repetition or by immersion or doing things? You know, how would you teach? So by doing things, um, each teacher, um, there, so there would be sort of quite a large group. There'd be sort of teachers within the group and obviously young children and the children and the teachers would naturally gravitate towards each other. I think each uh, each teacher and each child has their has their own strengths, much like a person has any person has their own strengths and their own weaknesses. Uh, so there was quite an organic uh, relationship in uh, to to them. They would sort of gravitate gravitate towards each other and then able to to then follow on specifically what uh, what that child would be interested in. Um, say they had a particular interest in um, in farming or in sort of rearing um rearing animals uh, growing plants um, and they would spend a little bit more time doing that uh, there wasn't a particular setting to go to um 
it would more be like a meet up point of right this is where we're going to meet for the day and then sort of go off into into the sea into the town so and we just go and experience what needed to be experienced good did uh, your female teacher die a natural death she did um although she got sick um mm -hmm. she did. what was the reason for her sickness I'm feeling a lot of chestiness here. Ah, that's a, as a communicator, this is kind of strange. Uh, what happened? Uh, was there some magic done or something else, some foul play? No, this is more uh, like an illness, like a bacterial illness. A bacterial illness. So I asked you, hi, Sif. So why was there such a weakness there that a bacterial illness could take over? What was the reason for that? Was there a psychological reason? Was there black magic or what was the reason? I think this was around the point that uh, the greys were and reptilians were starting to infiltrate into um, teachers were, were quite a target because obviously they're nurturing the next generation. If you can infiltrate uh, people that are guiding the next gen generation, then you can in infiltrate more people at once. So by being able to make a teacher sick or make certain influential people sick, you're able to um, start to cut off the 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 newer generations and start them with knowledge they need to progress further. So uh, she, I think she is, yeah, she just got, she got quite ill. Um, feel like a burning almost in my chest here. Mm -hmm. So were they able to, you know, um, compromise her and bring her dark material through her or were they just able to weaken her and it was a, it was a weakness um, so that she died. Yeah, she died from the So did they abduct her, or in which way did they affect her? Did they maybe use remote technologies? I'm getting poison. Oh, was this a astral poison, or was this actually uh, something put into the food or water supply? Um, so it was. It, yeah, a physical poison. Um, we, I think we're drinking here. Yeah. It was a physical poison as such. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, she was probably not the only one that got affected by this. No, no, it became quite a problem. So um, I asked uh, for the divine beings of justice and light and the protectors of humanity. Yeah, there has been, uh, you know, manipulation by the grace. You know, that is definitely illegal being done to humanity, manipulating them, uh, which is a great infringement on free will and also a betrayal of truth. So we like to have this rectified. You like to have those aspects that got compromised, uh, liberated, brought into the heavens, of course, taught about forgiveness. You like to have the effect that it had on the timeline you know, cleared, and also the bleed over of these toxins into the other incarnations cleared, and, um, you know, positively healed in, in every aspect throughout all creation. Um, 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 and then those that did this, that are responsible, you like to have the karma, the negative karma transferred to them. And um, then, you know, brought to somewhere where they, can, where they cannot do harm to humanity anymore. The um, creator can decide, of course, you know, what is best, what is highest. Um, 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 and this is asked, so how does this poisoning still affect you in this lifetime, you know, which we are clearing right now, but how did it bleed over? I've always had quite a weak chest. Um, I had asthma quite badly when I was younger, um, and I used to get uh, pharyngitis. I don't know if you know, if that's an infection of pharynx. Um, and I lose my voice <laughs> when I if I get quite ill, I end up losing my voice quite a lot. <laughs> right. Okay. Do you still have your tonsils? I do. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. So let's just ask. Um, well, ask your male high self to step in front of you. 
and then ask him to access source and then to send you this healing throat love. Smile like an idiot so you get the whole spectrum. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. You ask that you, you be given a turquoise necklace that will assist you in your communications from now on. And in your self-expression, so it be whole again, just be strong again, that it is vibrant and not compromised in any way, that it is straight from your spirit, straight from source, truth, nothing but the truth. In a way that it can be absorbed and assimilated easily. Um, um, um. And any changes to the DNA that we uh, like to have those also shifted. Um, um, um. Okay, so did she make it? Did the teacher make it into the heavens? Yeah, yeah. Although the the sickness is stable now. Mm -hmm. Well, ask her. The, um, has the sickness been removed now? I hope yeah. Very cool. All right. <laughs> and we thank I'm those beings that I help. Yeah, yeah, that, that feels good. <laughs> so, uh, let's see, uh, incarnation number five. Are you a male or female? A female again. Mm -hmm. And what is your job? I'm a mother. I'm a I can't my children. <laughs> the nice simple life again. So how many kids do you have? I had quite a few. Um I I'm weakened in this life. I think um what what had happened to me in the pre previous life has carried on over into this life. So I'm quite weakened, so I wasn't able to do a huge amount more other than um other than yeah, providing for my children, raising the children. So how many children do you have? Several. Several, yeah, seven. Oh, seven. Oh, so yeah, seven, seven children. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's ask. Do you know any of them in this lifetime? I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the kids you're having now, part of those. Yeah. No. All right. So, yeah, just send love to them. Mm -hmm. You know, on this lifetime, they explain a lot of stuff. And so, uh, how did her weakness affect those seven children? I was short of breath quite a lot. Um, I wasn't able to, I wasn't particularly fit. Um, so, I, I struggled really with, um, with having them and with raising them. I, wasn't able to do a huge amount else apart from um, raising them and looking after them. I wasn't able to leave the house a huge, a huge amount. Mm -hmm. Well, when she died, uh, did she go into the heavens? She did. She was a good woman. She was just very weak. Yeah, okay, so she made it. <laughs> Any of the kids are still stuck on the astral plane? No. No, we clean that. All right. Mm -hmm. So maybe whatever guilt she felt, you know, about not being able to provide. Uh, let's have this clear. Well, let's ask her, did she imprint you? Is there a bleed over from the weak mother in this lifetime? Yeah, the the weak um, the weakness part of it, the feeling um, like not doing enough um, definitely comes over into this life. So let's have this, you know, um, Inadequate feeling of not doing enough cleared. Okay, so let's move on to lifetime number six. Are you male or female? Female. Female? Male. Male, okay. The carousel is changing. And what's your occupation?
can hear music. You're a musician. Mm. What kind of is your favorite instrument? My favorite, but in this lifetime or in the in the not Atlantean. in that like in that lifetime. <laughs> the Atlantean lifetime. I can hear um it's almost like a flute kind of sound. But like a, a like a woodeny wooden mm. kind of is it is a, a little nasal? Like you know, something like <laughs> No, it's nicer than that. <laughs> No, it's uh, it's much more. Um, yeah, it's quite a, like a, a soft like kind a of melody. It's like a flute. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. the flute is one of the most expressive instruments there, are, mm -hmm. yeah? between the violin and the saxophone, in my opinion. So, um, <clears throat> so you play flute? Are you part of an orchestra, or are you uh, just a solo performer? We're we're part. Of, yeah, I'm part of a group. <laughs> <laughs> as part of um, sort of the entertainment um yeah being part of like the entertainment group um and being involved in sort of rituals as well again uh, music is a uh, vibrational frequency um so that is something that was tapped into quite a lot was creating a uh, vibrational frequency via sound um and through different instruments so uh, <laughs> so your music uh, maybe was not so much like songs like you know nowadays it was like this tibetan things where they have like uh, this big uh, when you know didgeridoos this big mountain horns and gongs and yeah, all kinds blocks. of uh, yeah strong sounds although um with the instrument that i played i wasn't able to play more melodies um as it was a higher pitched instrument um it wasn't always necessary um necessarily long Long sort of droning kind of sounds. It was um, yeah more of a lighter kind of frequency sound. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just look at the range that you were engaged in as a musician in those times. So you know, was your group first of all how how large was this group? Like ten or fifty or about about ten fifteen about fifteen about fifteen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So were you ever in, engaged in using doing things like levitation of objects? No. no not, nothing of you. Mm -hmm. Was it, uh, were you used for healing? You know, where there was an obstruction somewhere and you would use, create sounds to purify, yeah, we, to help release? Yeah, we could do that with healing. Where, um, where there's quite a large group of us, we're able to play, play most of the different frequencies through different instruments. Um, so by doing it in in sort of set times um, and being able to sort of almost create like a like a healing song, um, like an intuitive healing song throughout music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you guys would just jam, you know, and then uh, whatever spirit would <laughs> move you, you would do your thing, or were there like pre-formulated songs or formulas for certain diseases or situations? So we were able to do, it was mostly intuitive, so we kind of, tapped into what that person needed at the time to be able to clear what needed to be cleared or um, to bring the vibration to what they needed um, so that you, we could do sort of like a almost like a party kind of atmosphere so it was more upbeat um, or if it was a, a ceremony where somebody was passing over it was um, something that was a little bit more sombre um, and also there was um, helping people that were that were in pain um, and sort of experiencing illnesses within the body. Uh, the frequencies of the different instruments would help that would help that illness to, to break away. Mm, yeah, I can. And, you know, through resonance, this makes a lot of sense. So let's just see. Your instrument was the flute. So what kind of stuff was the flute very good at? Um, so that the more of the higher pitch um, sounds um, that is good at breaking away um, parts of like, the higher aspect of the self. So any sort of is within the higher aspect that was um, yeah able to get through to those. Mm -hmm. that, that is correct. Um, also, um, would you um, use the flute also to open the heart? You know, they can very sweet melodies that are heart opening. Did you use those too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And as the two, please be shown um, your best heart opening flute melody. And maybe you can retain it, remember it. I was singing it out. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm not sure if I'm able to do this. I don't know. <laughs> let, let it rip. You know, if it doesn't work, we cut it out. So you know, don't worry about it. <laughs> right, that's after what I'm feeling a bit dry mouth. There. Getting a bit blocked with this, to be honest. <laughs> Let me help you a little bit. I sort of hear it in my mind, but I wouldn't know how to how to put that out. You just let it rip, you know, just uh, just just start. And maybe initially it's some croaking, but don't worry about it. <gasps> I'm hot too. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I I never. I literally never do anything like that. So that was uh, that was a bit strange for me. <laughs> yeah. It got a little distorted by the you know the automatic um, voice limiter, but uh, don't worry about it. So what I noticed, so there were a lot of R ah sounds, and R ah sounds they always expand the heart. Then okay. the flute, like an E, you know there. Okay. E, you know affects the higher chakras, just as you described. You know it's right on. Okay. So, and uh, let's ask, so uh, did the musician die a natural death? He did, yeah. So he's in the heavens, I guess. And uh, how does he affect you in this lifetime? Or what gifts are available from this aspect in this lifetime? I love the music. Um, being, yeah, completely involved with music. And although I can't actually play any musical instruments, um, that's something that I'm just completely not... Not in tune with at all. Um, I I understand Senior? music. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I understand music and I understand melodies um, and I understand um, sort of especially when I'm listening to like DJs, like how it is that they should mix music into each other um, and how what what sort of music goes well together. Um, and that yeah, that's an aspect that I've brought over into this life. That almost like an innate understanding of um, the good music and what sounds nice. So cool, yeah, and my heart is open. This really opened my heart, what you did there. Nice, the, the melody worked. Now, these are thought forms, these are ancient sometimes, and, um, you know, they have a potency. In, in the Hindus, they, are, they have, they consider melodies to be ragas, they have their own consciousness. Actually asked whether, you know, your male musician was able to hook up with ragas, yes or no? Yeah, yeah. Actually, another aspect of myself that I think we've discussed before was um, was the dancer. I was dancing in um, it, the Indian temples. I think um, I was a dancer, and so that's uh, an aspect that's all connected um, connected from that lifetime. Yeah, cool. All right, let's just go to lifetime number seven. Um, oh God, this is. Uh, the heart chakra is definitely there. And um, so is this a male or female? Female again. Mm -hmm. And what's her job? And this is a uh, healer. Healing yeah. with uh, plant medicine. Yeah. 
So, um, okay. So, um, does she do? What's her, what's her technique? You know, does she use sound, hands on healing, projection, herbs, tools? Uh, so, this is herbs and, um, and also sound as well, vibrational um, sounds. Mm -hmm. Does she create the sounds with her mouth or through instruments like gongs or conch shells or other instruments? So this is done through instruments, um, through through gongs, um, and also the, called, the rattles, cri the crystal bowls. Oh, wow! Oh. Mm -hmm. oh. And whilst oh, yeah. her, whilst making herbal remedies, um, again, this is like a, a community thing, like a, a group thing. Um, we would infuse remedies with with the vibration as well. Mm -hmm. uh, could be, give extra oomph again, or adding the vibration, adding vibrations into one another. Yes, yeah, so uh, communal energy. So um, I really love those crystal balls when you, you know, vibrate those. Yeah. And uh, those patients can be modified. Let's say, did she modify them? I mean, you can, for instance, um, Put like a rose quartz or an amethyst you know, or whatever you you know in there which yeah. will modify the vibration. Did she do something like this? Yeah, so we can um, amplify different vibration through different uh, through different crystal frequencies. Um, this also alters the effect that the vibration is having. Um, the intention that we're putting depending on what crystal is used at the time. Yeah. Okay. Now, does she also interact, you know, besides <laughs> um, with those balls in other ways besides using the stick? I mean, I mean, does she do any chi projection or visualization while she's using those balls? Yeah, so the energy, um, the energy is pulled in from source and again, sort of pushed out. Um, there's the imagination, uh, sort of, yeah, the imagination of whilst doing the bowls and um, sort of creating different um, herbal mixtures uh, that they're putting in the energy and pushing it out through the bowls and then the bowls are able to um, fine tune the frequency um, and sort of, the, again, it's almost like the magnifying glass effect where it's sort of able to focus the energy onto something specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I, <laughs> I understand, cool, excellent. Um, did she die a natural death? Yeah. Okay, so no trauma, any trauma we have to heal with her? No. Mm -hmm. How does she affect you in this lifetime? Again, the, the love for vibrational music and the frequency and also the, uh, the interest in herbal remedies, natural remedies. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Get yourself a nice surround sound system with a good subwoofer. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like like I have. To, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, and no apartment. <laughs> you have to have your own house. <laughs> to let it vibrate. Okay. So, let's go to vib uh, vibration number eight and uh, incarnation <laughs> number eight on the Atlantean scale. And Male or female? Female. Mm -hmm. And what's her job? A writer. A uh, what? Writer. She works with water? No, writing. Oh, writing. So writing, yeah, writing yeah. stories, writing information. So there are different types of writers. So some, uh, you know, they just do like bookkeeping, <laughs> you know, they describe. Mm -hmm. um, some are uh, uh, like historians, you know, they are, uh, you know, they are kind of creative. They use oh, intelligence. Yeah. And some are more poetic, artistic, mm -hmm, composing speeches or songs or prayers. Mm -hmm. So what kind of a writer was she? I thought here that this was, uh, this was more of an artistic kind of writing and um, so more poetry um, and so also writing down sort of life experiences and turning it into, into stories for, for people to tell, almost like you would tell a story to a small child um, 
So perhaps, yeah, perhaps these are stories. Mm -hmm. So um, let's say when she writes a story, first of all, you know, how did they write in Atlantean time? Did they have some like paper, like parchment and, um, and ink and or how would they write? Or clay tablets maybe? So I've got here parchment, uh, parchment and ink. They were able to use the um, clay tablets, but it's, it's much more time consuming. <laughs> right. But being able to yeah, write right. the um, paper is, um, yeah, it's, it's the preferred way. And it's also um, another way to express the artistic um, side of the writing is uh, through the handwriting, um, through the movement of um, the way that you put the words down onto paper. That in itself is an art form. So it was close, close to calligraphy you, you used there. Mm -hmm. I see. And so um, how would this poetry be d disseminated to the public? I mean, were there papers, newspapers, or would there be a recitation where people came to? So yes, so there would be readings. Um, so part of, uh, part of the culture there is, is to enjoy things like that. So there would be readings. Um, done either on a large scale or on a smaller scale. Um, readings could be done from events that had happened, um, and it almost like a like a newspaper. So events could be recorded and then read out to people. Not everybody was able to um, was necessarily able to to read, so um, it would be read out to people as well for people to get like a source of information. Too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did she also um, was involved to writing down in, in historical verse, um, maybe that were put into clay tablets for later times? No. No, she was not involved. Just, yeah, it was creative. <laughs> and hmm, interesting. So uh, the crafting of words. So uh, would she channel, um, you know, her poetry as such, just like Mozart would do? Or, you know, we have many channels nowadays that uh, pretty much present the material, you know, print ready. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was uh, is another form of expression um, is by yeah being able to channel the energy and put it down on paper. Um, it could be done in a way to, to uplift, uplift people. Um, to help them to feel more connected um, and yeah, to help them to feel more positive. And so <laughs> she died a natural death, I hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she is expressing herself through you, I guess. So, you know, you're very well spoken. Yeah. Is this, is, 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 is <laughs> um, this her? Yes, yeah, so uh, quite articulate. Um, and I, I enjoy writing as well, actually. Yeah, enjoy writing. Mm, yeah, you're going through all the arts. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's move on to lifetime number number nine. And are you male or female in this lifetime? I've got male, and um, I'm feeling like um, like a soldier, almost mm. like a like defensive. So you're a young male soldier. Mm -hmm. And well, uh, what type of soldier are you? So what kind of armament do you have? What is your what are your weapons? I can see a really long spear. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm necessarily like a going out like a fighter is in like part of an army, I feel like it's more of uh, like a guard, like a defense guard. Mm -hmm. So are you like a bodyguard or are you somebody that's guarding a certain portal or door? Um, I can be uh, more of like a building, so. Mm -hmm. So you're building security. Mm -hmm. Now what is the building that you mainly guard? It feels like quite a, like a holy place, like a very special place. Mm -hmm. Okay. And who are the people, you know, that you have to keep out or the forces that you have to keep out? So, this is 
people that have impure intentions towards what's going on inside. Um, so inside is um, is somewhere where people can practice um, evolving and sort of opening up, opening up higher aspects of themselves. Um, I believe this is around the time that other entities were getting more involved in the Atlanteans and this was at the point where they were wanting to stop them from progressing too far um, and there were a lot of attacks on the buildings um, there were people sort of disguising themselves as somebody that was wanted to go in to evolve and actually they weren't they were trying to find out what was going on in there so that they could use that information to bring them down as well so this was so this looks like you had terroristic, uh, you know, uh, this is terrorism, not this is local terrorism, you know. Uh, that uh, so this basically this were people that got taken over by the gray or by the dark side and then used as proxies like maturing candidates, so to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like nowadays, right? Yeah. <laughs> Very much. Know, just like nowadays, all these uh, false flag things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So this means um, you, as this soldier or as this guard, you had psychic abilities to pick out uh, who was impure and who was not. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the empath part of me was very finely tuned um, into yeah being able to pick up exactly what sort of intentions people had. Um, it was almost um, like a psychic warfare, almost um, because. The, the greys were very very intelligent also they also knew what it was that they needed to do to avoid detection um, and we had to try and be one step ahead of them and know what and really be able to pick, pick them out from the ones that were involved in the yeah. we're just trying to fuck it all up basically yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 welcome to my world <laughs> so <laughs> and um, yeah so Ah, oh, God. So he had to go there and pick him up. And, oh, yeah, how would he know that somebody was, you know, taken over, overshadowed of impure intense? You know, would he see the force field or would he feel it in his own body? Like darkness, like a dark shadow over. Like a oh. shadow over somebody. So over the face, a darkness over the face? Yeah, but it... Mm -hmm. Most people couldn't see it. Oh, yeah. Now, I've seen, uh, you know, a dark shadow over people's faces, yeah. So this means that they are, um, yeah, that they are more like mental faculties have been taken over and compromised, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's almost hijacked. Mm -hmm. So um, how, let's just see, how was he trained to be that sensitive? Did they lock him in a dark room and threw rocks at him until he went away or, you know? Years and years worth of training. <laughs> 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 uh, if, only, if, if only it was that exciting though. Years and years of training, psychological training, um, understanding, um, yeah, understanding uh, the nature of the Atlantean people, um, so the, the elder people that were uh, that sort of put this work together were wanting people to evolve and um, they're obviously they're, they're, they're much more pure um, so they're able to pick out the differences in the people that have been sort of hijacked uh, that are able to that are there to try and bring bring the Atlantean people down they're able to pick out those differences the character differences within them um, so they're able to help train people to spot those differences um, but it's, it's very intensive it's, um, it's yeah, not a very easy thing to do. Yeah, it looks like a part learn. Jedi training. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Now let's just also look, I mean, as a martial artist, you know, I always interested. So how do they train him? You know, his type of training and also, you know, whether he's also training in chi movement. You know, how to, uh, you know, like Jedi style, knock somebody, you know, through psychic. Yeah, that's, that's literally what I've just seen, to be honest, is that um, I've seen it like a physical knocking back. It's almost, um, as I'd said earlier, the, um, like the force field that was able to protect Atlantis, it was almost like this was also able to be used 
protect like the, these holy spaces as well. Uh, the guardians of it were able to create their own force shield to, yeah, to physically repel, um, repel the ones that that were impure that were wanting to go in there. Now that's interesting. So I want to see. So let's say he knows, you know, trouble is coming, and it's time to gear up to suit up. Um, with the chi force field. So how does he do this? Does he access like earth and go soups himself up or you know, does he um, you know, get they're it from the heavens? Link, they're able hmm? to link, link into each other's the, um, energy. The energy of the temple is they're also able to draw on that as well. I think this is also <laughs> going back to uh, like to portal hotspot. They have uh, certain areas within within the civilization where their energy is much more concentrated and that's where these um, higher knowledge temples are built. So they're able to not only join each other's energy, but they're also able to uh, join the temple energy as well and uh, they combine it all together and push it out. Yeah, that's um, absolutely correct. This, uh, in my experience, this happened uh, let's say I had access to one of those temples and they had machines in there. And they would give you different types of chi for different purposes. And some of the chi I could take into myself and give it to others to soup them up. Yeah. You know, I mean, so, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I was ahead of circle you know, of, yeah. of friends, you know. And so, yeah. Uh, so you were, uh, you know, a guardian of, of uh, one of those places, I guess. Yeah, ask, <laughs> ask him whether he knew me in this lifetime. We did. I feel like you were more of a commander, <laughs> much like you are now. <laughs> in, in this physical world, I was quite humble in this lifetime. Not so big position. Not Anyhow, commander, but sort of more of a, a higher knowledge. Yeah, yeah, and I understand. Cool. Yeah. So, um, how does he affect you in this lifetime? Of defender of um, of truth and um, wanting to see, um, yeah, not wanting to be fooled by those that are pretending to do well but actually aren't, <laughs> which um, has manifested itself quite a lot in the past few years, I must say. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's um, go ask to have him show you a situation where he actually saved your bacon, <laughs> where he protected you, you know, from the deceiver or something like this, or from the grace. Um, I would say with the, the current situations that we've been experiencing over the past couple of years, that um, very quickly was able to see through that and understand that it wasn't as, as it was being made out. Right. <laughs> no. <laughs> still, still very much there as well. <laughs> uh -huh. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we uh, sent him a lot of source love here. Let's give him a high five. And... So, uh, did he uh, die a, a natural death or was it a violent death as a, as a warrior? You know, you never know. No, he, he was okay. He died naturally. He, he, had, he, was, he was very tired in the end. I, I feel like there's a lot of tiredness. There was a lot of um, energy movement going on. Um, so, yeah, he, he felt tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's Tired for many psychic wars. So he yeah. asked that he, that he be, you know, given, uh, like, be treated to the Arcturian love feeling and ascension spas. <laughs> Got yeah. a nice work right. over. <laughs> and <laughs> just cheer him up and, you know, heal his wounds and all the curses and spells and other astral devices that were sent unto him and unto his parallel selves, you know, from all different timelines and directions and dimensions. Yeah, please clear all that stuff. <laughs> Um, 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 mm -hmm. And yeah, also if there was any energy stolen from him, you know, or any other compromise being put onto him, you like to have this clear, especially from the Dracos and the Grace. Um, um, um. Yes. And now let's go to number 10, the latest uh, Atlantean incarnation. Are you male or female then? I'm female. And what's your job? Um, well, I can feel that I'm one of the people that was going into the temp into the temples for higher learning, wanting to expand. So you were a, a 
pupil of higher learning in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. And uh, which, uh, what was her goal, I mean, of her education? What did she want to become? So I was um, trying to move up dimensions. So most Atlantean people are of uh, four dimensions four-dimensional beings um, and if you were able to start moving up into fifth-dimensional beings and mm -hmm. um, so I was trying to expand myself to move up to fifth-dimensional. Mm -hmm. So you and <clears throat> so you advance course and uh, what kind of exercises uh, or techniques did you use to get there? The main, you know, there are probably like several pillars <laughs> of uh, elevation of ascension so the the main one being um sort of practicing love um in every sort of almost every situation really um being able to be completely unattached um to any form of ego um and expressing love in whatever was happening which is, which is quite a difficult thing um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to, to always express love and to always express forgiveness and to always be unattached um, to live like that constantly um, is, is very, very difficult um, very um, exhausting um, but yeah, I, I was trying to get there <laughs> trying to live the love and compassion at all times Well, did you suffer from people taking advantage of this? Yeah, I think that's the problem, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. as there's people constantly trying to test me. Um, people that uh, there's almost like a, a sense of like jealousy there, like not wanting you to sort of go up into that higher level, um, mm -hmm. because it makes them sort of look upon themselves, um, and they think, oh well, maybe I could be doing that, but I don't really want to. Um, so there, there's that sort of sense of envy then that's then pushed out. Yeah, no, I've seen this, you know, a lot too. You know, there's a lot of spiritual envy. I mean, there's envy in every community. You know, in spiritual community, there's spiritual envy. You know, there's normal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just like little monkeys part, and dogs yeah. and cats, you know, there's jealousy and envy. Mm? Yeah, it comes with the human chip. Emotions that we, that we all experience and that we all have. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Uh, so she was a disciple. This means that something happened. Did she die a natural death? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, did she uh, reach the fifth dimension? Not quite, no. So no. is she still on the astral plane? Yeah. Yeah, not quite crossed over. But I think there was a, there was a part of that aspect that felt disappointed that it wasn't able to quite get there, um, and mm -hmm. sort of held on to that. It was um, yeah something that I really really yearned to, to sort of level up in that respect, um, and I felt like I couldn't quite get there. So how is you know, how is she still affecting you in this lifetime? So um, the, the constant thirst for knowledge, <laughs> always wanting to learn something new um, and trying to, yeah, constantly sort of evaluating everything that I do, everything that I think, um, yeah, constantly evaluating myself. Um, constantly fixing, yeah, constantly fixing, always improving. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let's ask her, let's ask your high self, you know, she is so much smarter. <laughs> you know? So where did that incarnation kind of fail? What was your weakest point, you know, that made her not reach the fifth dimension? It was um, the, yeah, just, it was trying to maintain the, the love and compassion at all times. Um, it was quite difficult. Um, I let other things um, affect how I was feeling. Um, and uh, sometimes dwelled on things a little bit longer than I should have. Um, the, the irritation towards things, um, it, the irritability was, um, was definitely one that I tended to get sucked into. I think where there was obviously trying to test as well, mm -hmm. test me in leveling up, um, I would get irritated with it and just uh, because I didn't understand why. Why are you trying to do that? Like, I don't get it. Um, 
I would see I sometimes get caught up into that and also um, there's a there's a part of the ego there that it was um yeah quite difficult to sort of balance out and get rid of the the ego aspect of it and bit love the ego right and so I, um, it's asked you know your high self was this honestly due to sabotage or was this actually a failing you know off to your side maybe you weren't diligent enough or do you actually get sabotage and you just didn't know it I would say it's more a failing on my part mm -hmm. right and so did this part you know this incarnation number 10 is did she go to the heaven or was she still around on the astral plane Still in the afterlife. Yeah, <laughs> that's why we coming here. We talking now. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah, let's. There's heavens in front of you, mm -hmm. and it access your source love and just blast her. Smile like an idiot. Maybe tickle her a little bit. Mm -hmm. So and she asked and her spiritual teachers that actually made it into the heavens to come. She asked also our best ascension teams to come and invite her to the Arcturian love healing and ascension temples and to reunite her there with other friends and loved ones that she had in that incarnation that are also still on the astral plane. Mm -hmm. And then show them all the higher perspective on their life. Mm -hmm. Whatever was sabotage, whatever was astrological, whatever was vows or curses or karma or volunteered war experience. Mm -hmm. And then bathe them with so much love and wisdom that they be able to forgive each other mm -hmm. and ask for forgiveness. And we ask Lord Gandesh to come and help him transmute any obstacles that are there in this higher understanding and in forgiveness. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And now he asks for the unconditional love of source to just transmute whatever keeps her trapped, whether these are contracts, vows, curses, claws, booby traps, promises, mm -hmm. or cages or other technologies. Please clear all and escort her into the heavens. Um, 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 and with her loved ones. Yeah, and as she's leaving, clear all her baggage, you know, all her pain, you know, all her guilt about so-called failing. Mm -hmm. And show her how much she can actually assist in the end, you know, once she has ascended. Herself, you know, how much she better she can assist from the heavens. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, here she's Definitely leaving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she made it. Mm -hmm. let's, let's make sure all the rest, all her baggage has been cleared, you know, from the end and other parallel incarnations throughout the timelines. Amen, amen, amen. Oh, you feel the elevator feel? Mm -hmm. Feel like yeah. a feeling of energy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah.